regulation and with a, a, a consent form that need to be signed uh, as what symptoms to expect. Probably you can see in the news uh, that uh, a couple of days ago that some of the patient that was in this phase, they started to, to, to have some reactions to the vaccine. In an in average, for, uh, for to, to complete this, the first, second, and third phase is no less than 12 months to 18 months reasonable. Anything before uh, is very risky, and as unfortunate in this situation as you can see, uh, is uh, there are no, uh, it's difficult uh, to uh, different type of uh, reactions. Also, nobody, the countries are not some of the countries are not working in in, in collaboration. Uh, until recently, the collaboration is start to get more and more. But some, everybody is trying to do their own thing separate, and, and things. So at the end of the day, this is not good uh, for, for in general. No, it's, it's, I think so. We need to try to get as a society together, uh, and of course, uh, that's one of the, the, the things I want to mention concerning the vaccines. Doc, the next question that begs asking is still related to vaccines. While the vaccine might be well in the future, what about the treatment options that are being uh, explored now? I know there's Remdesivir, which is a new hopeful um, solution. Uh, where are we with a proven treatment? Unfortunate is that uh, the Remdesivir, we will need to ask WHO to make it available if it's something that is treatable because uh, at this stage, uh, no, no, this medication is not available in the country. No, I mean that uh, we need to try to uh, look for the way to the uh, PAHO and see how we can get uh, some of this medication. Then the, there are several options on, of treatment for COVID-19, of course, the initial treatments like hydroxychloroquine and the combination of acetromycin is showing that probably is not the best choice. Uh, um, then we have uh, some other adjunct supportive therapies. One of these is the use of steroids that is available in the country uh, and we can use it. Uh, some other uh, therapies that have been promising is the use of convalescent plasma. Uh, uh, Still, some discussions, but it is is no is seen that is is promising. That essentially means that the, from the patient that they they um, got uh, COVID-19, we can uh, go uh, of course with certain protocols, making sure that they are free of virus. Then we can collect the plasma, and that could be a, a, an option of treatment that is reasonable and and is not expensive. The, the situations of uh, or the situation in this in these stages that we are uh, start to slowly open our country that need to be uh, very uh, with a strategy uh, because at the moment that we will see that is in uh, some positive cases and probably a raise on numbers we need to be able to to lock down the country again uh, I mean that is a it's a very tough situation. We will be back to normal. Uh, everybody would like to, to, to say that, but unfortunately, uh, at least at least in the following six months, I don't think so. We are going to be be uh, living over normal as before. And again, this is a social responsibility. Uh, we as a population, we have we need to play our role. And as uh, one of the most important questions is, uh, do we need to wear a mask outside? The answer is yes, because I'm protecting myself and I'm protecting each other, the other person, and this is social responsibility. With this time, with COVID-19, we need as much as we can, even over differences in many things, we need to try to get together for the best thing of our, our lovely Belize country, because I think so. Uh, we are blessed, uh, and we need to continue that way. Wow, thanks, Doc. A lot of food for thought in terms of where we are in terms of the medicine behind the vaccine and in terms of dealing with COVID-19. A lot of ground has to be covered. We thank you very much. We know that you have an emergency and so you'll be forced to leave. But thank you for joining us today and being a part of our show. And thank you for the opportunity.
with those responses, uh, we're going to go ahead and take a break. And when we come back, we'll continue with more on covering COVID-19, a Channel 5 special. At Dutch Lady, we give you delicious and nutritious milk. We make sure our milk is filled with essential nutrients, calcium, vitamins, and protein. Dutch Lady gives everyone in the family a strong start to the day. Keep your family healthy and happy. Dutch Lady, building strong families since 1871. Member owners are encouraged to save regularly, borrow wisely, and repay promptly. No use keeping the money in your pocket. Soon as you turn wrong, you know you ain't got it. So as money goes from hand to hand, give your cash to the umbrella man. I tell him you save, save, save. The credit union way. Save, save, save. It will make you rich someday. So nice, so nice, Caribbean price. Need you in my life, Caribbean price. So nice, so nice, 100% Belizean, 100% pure and natural. Yeah, for the young and the old, for the rich and the poor, we drinking Caribbean pride. Yeah, for the hot and the cold, so me want a little more, and me not tell no lies. So nice, so nice, Caribbean price. Need you in my life, Caribbean price. So nice, so nice. Well, alright, tell them we drinking Caribbean pride. Orange juice, or get the grapefruit, sweet. Sweet and unsweet and you can choose Get the apple, the pineapple, the fruit punch Just pop the bottle, yeah Quality in every sip Me tell you how me taste the pride in every drip, yeah Caribbean pride number one Tell, tell them we drinking Caribbean pride Welcome back to Uncovering COVID-19 at Channel 5 Special. I'm your host, William Neal. This week, many people were relieved as we saw some relaxations of the measures taken under the state of emergency. However, we're still in the midst of a global pandemic. And even though Belize has more than 31 days of no new confirmed cases, there's quite a bit of work that needs to be done in terms of ensuring that we remain COVID free. Panel, with the measures being relaxed, the borders remaining closed, and repatriation process being outlined somewhat for students and Belizeans abroad, what are your thoughts? Let's start with uh, Mark Lizarraga. William, um, I think First of all, um, I have to say that the people are somewhat relieved by this uh, measure, of course. Many of us were beginning to get uh, coop sickness, locked up for so long, and we're looking forward to, to moving about and enjoying our country um, under the circumstances. Um, I think that there are many in the tourism sector as well that uh, obviously are longing um, for some sort of business flow some sort of cash flow, no matter how small it could be, because, of course, they've been starved of cash flow for so long. So it's good to get some semblance of the local economy going, and I think Belizeans um, uh, deserve to, to have some flexibility in movement, remaining cautious, of course, and always keeping in mind the protocols that we need to, to observe in this new norm uh, um, due to COVID-19. Do you think they went uh, far enough? Um, William, you know, in these matters, it is best for us to follow the guidelines of our health personnel in the country. I mean, they've been relatively successful thus far in guiding us through this, and I think we have to continue to respect their views. While there's no, while there's no playbook on COVID, I think that every country has to look at its capacity to handle the health a potential crisis that we could have and, and make um, um, adjustments and make recommendations based on that. We've done a pretty good job, we must say, thanks to our healthcare officials, the people in tracing, the people in, 
in, in, in, in our um, healthcare system have guided us in, in through this relatively unscathed. We've had a few, a few deaths, unfortunately, but, but we've been very lucky. Um, the prayers of many Belizeans have been answered, I believe, um, because we could have fared so much worse. So even though there's this relaxing that will be um, welcomed by especially those people in the tourism sector, I believe our citizens on a whole uh, feel like they deserve a little break um, to go out, breathe some fresh air, visit the country, uh, um, go spend a weekend somewhere. Um, uh, and this is going to be good not only for mental health but for, for, for economic health. Um, we need to get a lot of our businesses back and running in the, under the new norm, and, and this is but the first step. So while this is happening, though, William, we have to stress, as everyone else has, that this is no time to, to relax on social distancing, on the sanitation guidelines, washing your hands, not to touch your face, etc., etc. But um, I believe that um, it's a welcome first step, William, and one that eventually we had to take, and, and why not now? When we've reached that one month mark, basically of not having a new, a new case. Annie. Hi. Um, your thoughts on the same um, matter? Whether the um, relaxation uh, measures are sufficient? Uh, it, well, for now, for now, I, 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 first of all, let me be biased. I want to wish all teachers a happy, wonderful Teachers Day today. Yes, today. I agree. Okay. So sorry, I can't take you all to Miami, you know, but um, unfortunately that won't be happening right now. Um, but I want to wish them all the best, um, the most global profession ever. Um, but to your question, I must say that um, I, I, for my mental health, I, 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 I applaud it. Um, economically for those who, especially those in tourism, like what Mr. Vizaraga said, it is something that is um, a welcoming for them. Um, but I also want to stress I'm thinking as a, as a teacher, as an educator. Religions have a way of finding loopholes to rules. They don't like to follow rules. And um, it is necessary, and we need to ensure that you take care of me, I take care of you, and we'll get through this together. Mm -hmm. And I believe as long as our religion people understand that, the measures should be okay. But I am just asking all my religion people, we do not know, we're no experts in this. This is something new for us. Mm -hmm. It happened in 1820, it happened in 1920, and it's happening 100 years later in 2020. Something you might be thinking about there. But I'm just asking my Belizean people, the rules and regulations put in place, let us follow the guidelines, let's listen to our health officials, and let's do this together. Thank you, Ani. Dinesh, any thoughts? Um, um, I, I agree with Mark and Annie in, in both what they said regarding um, how much they've allowed the for all of us to get out and, 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 like you said, for your mental health and appreciate what it is that we have. I think going back to what Annie said was that it's important for all of us to follow those rules because I know we have this tendency to say, okay, we've been, you know, we've been given this sort of um, this freedom to, to, to move around and, and there's always you know, one or two individuals who decide that they're going to, to break these rules. One of the things they have to understand is that this freedom, if not exercised well and not respected, it's going to be taken away from all of us at some point. So I think that's important for everybody to understand that this is not um, about yourselves. This is not a this, this is not a time to be selfish. This is time to understand that this is this is something that can can you know for all intents and purposes, if you really look at it, can kill your family members. Um, this, you might be strong enough to, to and say, well, I'm cool, I'm strong, my immune system is going to be able to handle this, I can do whatever I want, but what you don't understand is this can affect your loved ones and the ones and people who you care about the most because those are the individuals that you are going to come into contact with on a daily base, basis very personally. And so I think that's an important part of all of this it, for all of us to understand that part. Now, thanks, Dinesh. Now, panel, as a group, when I asked earlier if the measures went far enough, some people on social media were clamoring for relaxations in terms of taco uh, vendors and also in terms of church atten attendance. What are your thoughts with regards to that? Mm -hmm. For some people, they said the taco, while 
government, uh, the relaxation rules benefit the tourism industry. It didn't look far enough at the informal uh, um, portion of the economy in terms of small uh, food handlers and providers such as taco um, vendors, which is, as you know, a favorite of many people. What are your thoughts on in that regard? I can say that I think that with regards to the, and, and, and I'm sure some of the taco vendors are probably going to get a little upset at what I have to say, but I, even pre-COVID, I feel that there needs to be a formalized structure for a lot of these street vendors as it pertains to their locations or their ability to sort of be, I understand the concept of wanting to be mobile, but I think there's, there's, a, there's much to be said to having a very formal structure or location for all of these individuals to be, um, I think it would serve a, 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 a greater purpose, whether it comes from a tourist-centric possibility or even from a revenue stream for the municipalities, and even from a from a perspective of being able to to um, to track and to sort of have a more hygienic element, because they would then be in a controlled environment. And had that been take had that been done previously you would be in a situation where you would then be able to open, whether it's an open air uh, facility or a private uh, facility where they would all be present and you'd be able to then go there and sit outside um, and, and enjoy it, whether as a tourist or as a local. I think that's something that needs to be looked at um, from all municipalities. And as you can see, the ones that are structured in a certain way have been able to open and the ones who were sort of informal, informal, be done have they have a set of issues. I'm not saying that I don't think they shouldn't be around, but I think there's 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 ways where this might be the best time to approach that. Um, that's my take on it. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mark? I still love the tacos though. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I think we all do. <laughs> Annie or Mark? Um, well, my thing with it is, of course, my thing is regulation. As, as an educator, I I strongly feel you need to follow rules. The Attorney General did say you can sell your tacos, but you can do whatever you want to do your barbecue on your private property. And I have seen some vendors doing that. Let us just do what we need to do now. So like what Mr. Bishwani said, they can come out afterwards in open air. See what um, Lee Mark Chang did? He put it on his veranda. I mean, he was an inside person. That was an outside person. I mean, with this COVID-19, we have to become a little bit more creative. And the rule is for now, you have to sell. If you want to sell, sell on your private property. Just do that for now, for the for tacos. Do that for now. You could be making your money. I still see lines um, for tacos. And people are on their private property, and you're buying tacos. So they're making their money. Um, so we need to just adhere to the rules. Let's do that for now. Make a little money. And after all, well and good, you'll be able to make more. And church? Oh, well, um, you, can, you can talk to God in your house. Um, I don't see the problem with if, if it's 10 people going to church or 25 in two weeks. Um, it's, it's something where you might, it, it, it's kind of like funny because a lot of people are asking me, should we be the first 10 to rush in and go to church? Does that include the priest? Does that include, include the altar guy? Well, I'm talking Catholic church here. Um, do, do you, does this include the pianist, the, the choir? So that leaves like two people can come to church. So there's lots of questions. But my, my answer for these people is that God is everywhere. And whether you're in church to whether you're not, whether you're listening to it virtually, um, I think he will appreciate that. Mark, um, any comments on William, this question? William, uh, I, I'll say what I said before. It, it is unfortunate that we don't have broader consultation and more input into these pieces of legislation before they're drafted so that you can get different perspectives. I heard somebody said, well, we can't go to church, but we should gather by the river, you know, so long as we keep the distancing or, or we'll have church in a bus. So there are certain clashes in, 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 in the way the legislation is written and the way people can interpret them and, and, and their inconsistencies, for example. Um, for example, this, this last week, we, we, we saw a Belizean uh, arrested at the border for, for, for coming into the country, which was clearly... Um, um, against our regulations, um, but we saw flexibility in, in, in the Guatemalan um, um, truck drivers coming in, 
uh, contrary to what our regulations are stated. So, you know, th this is a new experience for all of us. But to me, I, I think the answers are going to come from the collective. And the more people that input into the wisdom of legislation, the better. So um, it is a time where we're, we're all going to be making sacrifices and making uh, uh, decisions that we've never been uh, faced mm -hmm. with before. And it's not going to be perfect, but we have to make the best of what we have. We have to try and include as many people as possible. I keep saying that because uh, the legislators and the people that are sitting around the table right now are obviously not seeing and feeling, in my view, uh, what the mass uh, uh, population of Belize is seeing and feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a disconnect in, in many things, I believe, and we're going to talk about that later, I hope, especially when it comes to the economic, um, um, the economic uh, impact of a lot of these decisions. For example, back to the talk of vendors, I mean, one could make the argument that what the government is trying to do is to bring back the formal economy first and, and, and perhaps not uh, um, paying attention to the livelihoods of that 40% of our informal economy that are out there taking a lick, the small business people. And yes, it's true they can sell the tacos from behind their fence and that is a, uh, or within their, their property and that, that, that is a, is, is, is a compromise at this time. So we'll all have to make sacrifices. We'll ha all have to make, um, feel some sort of pain. Um, but I think that with a little more consultation, with a little more input from the different sectors, we could have a little less pain. All right, thank you very much, Mark. Now, you uh, spoke a little bit about what is happening in terms of uh, the economic recovery that will be um, necessary overall. Um, there are a couple of things that I want to cover with regards to the uh, whole economic recovery. We've seen in other countries where there's uh, a recovery plan, a schedule, uh, so to speak. I think Mexico, uh, just released one yesterday where they tell you, you know, airport will open by this date, etc. And some people argue that it makes no sense because uh, the pandemic is so unpredictable. But how important is uh, at least coming up with some kind of a calendar or schedule uh, when certain things will uh, return to normal, so to speak? You know, William, last week we spoke about the fact that in so many areas, there is no plan. Um, and why is planning important? Um, because as investors, as people, we need to plan our lives, we need to structure ourselves, we need to have confidence, we need to have hope. We need to make plans. And in many areas, we saw, when it comes to the economy, uncertainty in planning. Well, in specific reference to the airport, we've We've heard now that the plan is definitely for us to have some sort of credible test that can be relied on before we allow um, at least the international airport to be open, and, and that is wise. Um, because, like Doc suggested, uh, you, you would hate to see we have a, a, a explosion in a second wave or a third wave, and, and, and the people around us and the people certainly from from the US they're suffering a lot right now and, mm -hmm. and that would be where most of our tourism would come from in, in the past that is where most of them came from so I certainly concur that we need to be very careful about how we open our land borders because Mexico and Guatemala are going through this this explosion I certainly believe we have to be very cautious on how we allow people and what is the level of our risk that we can take in Belize when we open the airport but I think another thing that we need to be um, very vigilant about, and uh, when we have the opportunity, I'd like to speak about a press release from the Chamber of Commerce and, and one from the BBB that speaks specifically to where we go, how, how we move forward, and, and the whole macro, macro environment in our country and a macroeconomic environment. And then I'd certainly like to speak about um, what the Prime Minister said yesterday and, 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 and <laughs> the disappointment that that was in, in 
listen, listening to his, his strategy that he insists he's going to maintain. Now, um, Annie and Dinesh, any comments? Well, when it comes to economic wise, I'm thinking a lot of things. Um, yes, we want to make money. Um, yes, we want to get the economic um, road start again. But is that to the cost of many lives? Uh, we have to think health wise. We have to invest in our people and invest in our health system more than ever right now. There are three things that are supposed to be priority when it comes to our country development and growth of our country. You have to invest in health care, mm -hmm. you have to invest in education, and you have to invest in security of that country. Right now, we're, we're at two spots. We're at education and health. Without healthy people, you don't have a country. So everybody's thinking about, about making money, and I, I agree with that. You have to make your money, you have to what we have to do. But we have to first invest in health, and we have to look at the risk. There was this one guy, the President of the United States, well, make mention of the what he said. He said, yes, lives will be lost, but the economy will get back on track. Is that the route we want to go? Is that what we want to do? I don't think so. They have millions and millions of people. We don't. We can't afford to let one life lost. Two have lost already, and that's a lot for us. So economic-wise, we want to get back on track, but we need to do things slowly. I agree with what Mr. Lazaraga said about the, um, I'm very cautious and very wary about that airport being opened. I myself want my Malaysian Americans to come home. I myself want the students who are stuck. I myself want those who are stuck who went on vacation. But we really have to think about this small little country that we have and what can we withstand if we have a second wave. Cannot be selfless. We can't, we can't do that right now. So economic-wise, I think we have a lot to think about. We have the business, business people like Mr. Bijuani. We have Mr. Zaraga from the Senate. Senator for Business, um, I think they should be on board to find out if economic-wise is this going to help us. Do we want lives or do we want money? What are we going to do? So we have a lot to talk about. Dinesh? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I think we're all walking a very interesting tightrope here, uh, as it, and this is something new for not only for Belize, but for governments throughout the world. I think one of the things that we have to look at in Belize specifically now, even from an economic standpoint. Give, this gives us an opportunity for all of us to sort of figure out how how heavily reliant we were. I mean, we have an amazing product, so obviously we were heavily reliant on the tourism sector, and there were other sectors that, I guess, to some degree brought the foreign exchange, and, and those might not have necessarily uh, played in it, uh, as in a greater, as a great role in the in the grand scheme of things, but could now possibly play a better, a, a stronger role. I think we need to look at those. Um, I think tourism needs to be looked at, but it, we need to be very, very, very um, prudent in our decision making. And going back to what we've all said is that this thing is dynamic. It changes on a daily basis. We don't know what's going to happen this week. I mean, we, we obviously relaxed some of the measures, and this could bring Bring it, bring the second wave sooner than we, than some people might have anticipated or even wanted to have happen, and so then that would change the dynamic of how do you, what is your economic uh, playbook going forward? So the playbook, whether it's from the medical standpoint, um, from I'm sure even in education, that's is it's a very new, it's it's a new norm for everybody. I don't think there's anybody in this country or, or in this world who can say. Uh, this is, I was, I'm, I mean, I think other than maybe even, I mean, even if you look at uh, uh, hospitals worldwide, this is something that they've never had to deal with um, in any way, shape, or form. And so this is something where we're all, it's new for everybody. And, and going back to what Mark said, I think it might need a little bit more input from the stakeholders before this, with, with some decisions to be made. Um, that sometimes can take its own has its own has its own drawbacks because then that gets bogged down in decision making and how long that takes. Um, but I think there's a happy medium there somewhere. But again, we are all going to have to adapt in in in, in some cases just a little bit, just a pivot. And in some cases, it's major changes to the way we do business, to the way we educate our children, to the way we handle health care. There's it's going to be it's definitely a challenge. And whoever thinks that this is it's not going to be an uphill struggle, I think, um, as something else coming. But again, it's, it's
it's in the, the playbook that's going to be written now should be written in a way that it's that we know that so that this something of this magnitude doesn't kind of catch us off guard. I mean, there are going to be issues if you if you keep the economy tight, locked down for too long. Um, we're going to have foreign exchange issues. So yes, we could be open for business and want to sell domestically, but that also is going to come with issues because we need we rely on import on imports, and so therefore you need you have a foreign exchange issue. Um, at the same time, if you open up, you then have a healthcare system that's not necessarily. I mean, it's 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 good and it's you know in, in many facets, but it's not. I don't think structured to handle something of this of this magnitude um, of of what we've seen throughout the world. So I think it's. Um, I definitely wouldn't want to be a leader of any country at this point in time, but it will definitely go to show go to see what happens out of this. Um, so it, it's it, it is definitely trying times, and it's a very it's a tightrope walk for sure. Thank you, Dinesh. I want to pull back to Mark and what he said earlier. I know you um, alluded to the press release coming out of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry uh, that spoke to PSU and GOB deliberations. Um, your your initial reaction um, to that and what has what we've seen in terms of the public debate that is going between going on between um, both sides. Mark? William, thank you. You know, um, we were very excited by the possibility that the PSU was finally uh, going to press some weight against government to see if we could have some cost-saving measures. And we thought that that conversation could have been uh, very fruitful. To be honest with you, I mean, we're very disappointed at where we are today. Let me throw some things by you, William. Today, the government is needing about $90 million per month to pay its expenses, which indicates if it still needs $90 million per month that it hasn't cut any of its expenses as yet, which is in, it, in and of itself is a travesty. Compile that to the fact that it's only collecting about $30 million a month in revenue. We have about a $60 million a month shortfall. This budget, William, um, and, the, and the chamber makes a good case, it says the private sector and our employees would expect that the government and the public service could unite with energy to discover answers for slashing the cost of operation to the barest minimum just as the private sector has been forced to do just to survive. Here we are listening to the conversation to save $17 million out of a $1,200 million budget. When many of the people that we represent are having no income, or in many instances, people have lost 50, 60, 70 percent of their income. Where many workers in this country are without jobs, zero income, or many have been forced to take a pay cut. And now we see this debate about pay increases to the public sector workers and a refusal to relinquish their increments, their pay raise. And when they talk about a raise of pay, in a time like this one, everybody they get one pay cut or most people not have a job, then they fight about a pay raise. Are they out of step you, to your, in your mind? Well, it is, it, what, this, what, what the chamber suggests is that too many are involved in the debate are out of touch with the current reality we are universally facing. That is what the chamber really says. And, 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 and if you look at it, William, the prime minister's position and the public service position uh, are inconsistent with sound macroeconomic macro uh, uh, reasoning. How can you continue to expend the same $90 million and you're going to borrow, 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 borrow when your income is only $30 million? That is not a recipe for success. As a matter of fact, the Prime Minister alluded to that, but I'll get to that in a little, a little while. So the effects that we are going to feel are going to be worse 
because of the severe contraction in our economy. We can least afford it right now. We're already borrowing and investing in so many things that weren't giving us a return. And that is evident, obviously, by the fact that as a country we have very little savings and as a country almost half of our people were living at or below the poverty line. Let me interject one quick second, uh, Mark. I know the PSU also uh, sent a shot across the bow for the private sector, saying that 52% uh, uh, um, was paid um, in taxes, but you still have 48% outstanding, or, or 52 million and 48 million. I, I, but I know there was a, the numbers are right. Um, Look, when I listened to that, I said two things, William. One, I don't know, they said that re they compared the revenue uh -huh. to last year's revenue. Well, hello, we're in the middle of unprecedented contraction in our economy. What would you expect? That revenues would be, would be, be the same? And then if there's a shortfall in revenue, then you have the very public service who is to blame because if people are not paying their revenue, they're the ones who should be collecting it. If we're having loopholes and people are not paying, and we've been saying for years, please broaden the net, capture everybody that should be captured. That's the responsibility of the public service. So they were, I don't know who they were firing shots at. And I'm not going to stay here and defend everybody in the business sector and say that they're all paying their fair share of taxes. We know that many people do not pay their fair share of taxes. And we have been saying for years that we need to go after these people. And we supported the loans when they spoke about strengthening the tax yeah. collection system. So, so you know, to compare what we were, com what what revenues the private sector was paying last year with what we're paying recently, it is ridiculous to say the least. Because you're not comparing apples and apples. No. The business bureau as well came on record, William, to say that there was there were specific places that that there could be cost savings. Uh, incidentally, I listened to the to the Prime Minister, and he almost dismissed the, the, the fact that there was room to save, uh, to do cost savings, in spite of, I was reading, a very good series of, uh, of reports that were done on behalf of the government beliefs for cost saving measures. I mean, and some of these cost saving measures highlighted, highlighted many of the weaknesses in our system of governance, um, and looked at a wide cross-section of things that we needed to improve where savings could be made on vehicles and fuel. Human resource management. They, they talked about the hiring practices where allowances were being abused, where procurement and guidelines were not being followed and abused, where we needed more auditing, where we needed to watch for foreign travel. Well, no, we don't have no foreign travel. Where we were wasting utilities and we could be saving money in utilities. And they highlighted so many other areas. This is two cost-saving reports. One in 2014, one in 2018, done by members of the public service that have, for the most part, gone uh, um, unanswered. They haven't even paid any attention to them. And what we're seeing, William, is really a government and a public service, really, that has ignored, that has ignored, sorry, best practices for so long. Um, and, 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 you know, there's no talk of stimulus right now because we can't afford it. There's no talk of increasing exports. I was hoping that the, the Prime Minister would have a solution and, and have a plan to say how we're we going to address the foreign exchange needs that Danny was were, um, um, concerned about. No, the, the answer seems to be we're going to borrow and borrow and borrow and ignore all the sound macroeconomic macro strategies and direction that you need to go in. As a matter of fact, the Prime Minister openly admitted, he says, look, he says, um, the next person that comes will have to deal with this, and the next person that comes will have to deal with the IMF, knowing that down the road there may be very well be a government that is going to be f faced with a, a, a forceful reality from the IMF, that we have to cut staff and cut salaries. So why not begin to address it now? Why not show the public service and the people of this country that, look, I'm going to do my very best to cut where I can cut. 
I'm going to make efforts to curb corruption. I'm going to make an effort to curb the waste that you have highlighted in your two previous reports, the one in 2014 to 2018. It's almost that the Prime Minister is saying, you know, I, I know you're going to go off the cliff. I know the plane is going to go down. And I'm not going to be wrong. I'm going to jump out. And, and the next person that comes will have to deal with it. Now, well, he may have a golden parachute, but what about the rest of the people in this country that are living near poverty? And, and, and the increasing numbers that are going to be in poverty after this crisis? Um, one of the things I want to say at this point is, obviously, with the deepening of the crisis as we move forward, people look at the debate as maybe a distraction and divisive at best. How do we get everybody on board to say, listen, some hard decisions will have to be made and our leaders will do it. The business community will have to uh, lead in, in some regards because obviously everybody knows uh, the problems. It's how do we bond together to actually come up with solutions? William, let me say this. It is obvious that good advice has been given from many quarters. It is obvious that the decisions that have been made have been strictly focused around taking care of partisan base. And it is obvious that the Prime Minister does not want the rock the boat because of an appending election. That is so obvious. He doesn't want to go to fight with the public service because they protect each other's secrets, perhaps. I'm not saying we don't have good people in the public service. Don't get me wrong. But the public service has been quiet for too long, for too long, watching all the abuses and all the misuses of our public funds. So now, when I saw them get up, I was happy, to be honest with you. I, I, I said to myself, here we have a group now that should have spoken a long time ago that realize the predicament that we're in, that realize the seriousness of the economic situation we're in. And now they're going to fight not only for cost savings, or the impression I got was, look, we we're willing to take a sacrifice if government takes a sacrifice as well. But I don't hear that. No, no, it has come down to what is going to be a fight about salary increase. And to me, that is unrealistic. I don't know what world the politicians live in and the public service union uh, uh, live in. And I'm not advocating, please, for the firing of any public service people. None at all. I'm just saying that if we know that we have a burden that needs to be shared, it needs to be shared by everyone. And this is not a time to me to be arguing about this allowance and that allowance and the other man. When, you, when, you're, when, when you're being told that your salary is going to be intact, you're lucky your salary is going to be intact. All right, right? Mark. Uh, I think, William, that, that there are so many areas that needs to be addressed in the public service, and I think the reports are good ones. And perhaps at some stage, the BBB's recommendations need to be looked at. Government is, the BBB says that government is too big in many instances, too many ministries, too many ministers, um, and we need to look at downsizing and making the very cost-saving report says that a lot of our public institutions are not efficient. We spoke about efficiency in a previous show, and they, we need to start getting bang for the money that we spend on these public institutions. We don't have the money to waste anymore. So this is a time for serious, serious input from everybody. And we have to, again, live within our means. Look, we, the Prime Minister's plan for foreign exchange, you heard about foreign exchange a while ago, Mr. Bujani, is that we continue to borrow. Well, our borrowing capacity is severely limited. As you can see, most of the foreign uh, uh, lending agencies have not come up yet. We keep hearing the promise that we're going to get so many millions from them, but they haven't come up yet, quite, quite frankly, because we're a high risk. Or the fundamentals of our economics and our economic situation are not healthy. But you don't hear the conversations on how do you turn the economy around, having lost this 40% of your uh, economy from tourism, how are we going to turn the economy around, right? We're promised we're going to export cattle to, 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 um, to the Caribbean. That has fallen through. I mean, so we need to see serious plans, man. We need to see serious plans. Thank and, you, Mark. And we're not seeing them still. Thanks, Mark. Dinesh or Annie?
the public service union um, decided to, to approach it from a point of view in, in what was their concerns. I think um, from a business perspective, I think there's going, what's going to happen is um, some of the business industry, the different industries, um, more specific to, to different things, whether it's agro, um, retail, merchandising, um, production, productive sector, agro sector, they're all going to have to sort of adapt to, to this new norm. And what's going to end up happening is they're going to devise a mechanism or a, an environment that they would like to see their industry thrive. What's going to happen mm -hmm. is you're going to, they're going to approach, and in, in some cases where government um, needs to be part of the conversation and be, need to be part of the landscape, they're going to approach government. Now, what's going to happen in a situation like that, and I think if you, is, I don't think, let's say, for example, I go in from, from my industry perspective and I say, look, this is what we're thinking of doing. This is the environment we'd like you to create. The problem is we might also then be put in a situation where we're told that we're only looking out for our best interest and it doesn't then be behold to the best interest of, of the greater conversation. So it, it, it's, a, it's a, like I said earlier, it is a very tricky tightrope. I understand that there's, there, um, you know, I don't know the, 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 the crux of the matter as it comes to, to, to what Mark was discussing, so I can't really comment on it further, but I think just kind of stepping a few steps back, I think there's going to be a situation where industries are going to approach government um, and, and various entities to try to create an enabling environment for the success of whatever new um, processes or they would like to see. Um, it might fall on deaf ears. It might be. It might be told that they, it won't be possible, and so then, it, as we say, we go right back to the drawing board. And in some cases, people might criticize that industry. Or I mean, it could be agro, the, the agricultural sector. It could be the tourism sector. I'm sure tourism is going to want certain um, concessions be made um, for their industry in order to boost that part of the, 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 the um, economy and they might then get it or they might not and people might look at it from a standpoint of that's a little selfish that you're taking care of. I mean, I think people, I think government took a lot of flack for, from a lot of people when they said that they were going to put it, when it came to the economic, um, the unemployment recovery thing through social security, a lot of people said there was a lot of focus on tourist centric jobs or the job losses in the tourist centric industry. What about the individuals who lost their jobs in all the industries? So I think what's going to happen is you're going to have um, certain industries that are going to be highlighted, and their wants and their and, and their um, requests, whether through government or otherwise or other entities, might come under some scrutiny because they would obviously we all want some kind of leg up in in some way, shape, or form, and it might in some cases it might be a warranted request. In some cases, it might not be, and they're going to come under some kind of scrutiny. Um, and so, not having an idea of, of of another industry or the situation with with public service and government, it's kind of hard for me, at least, to make any sort of. But I can say that I can say that for sure, there are going to be industries that are going to want to have a, a, a more, for lack of a better term, enabling environment, whatever that might entail. And it'll come under some scrutiny because government might or might not um, concede to those um, environment to, to, to those requests, and it will come under some sort of scrutiny. So um, that's kind of my take on it. I think people are going to have to get very creative. I think yes, government has a responsibility to some degree to create an environment in which, um, and they're going to have to change a lot of how um, how they see businesses and how businesses will operate. Under under these new norms, and so there's going to have to be a, a some kind of mechanism put in place, and and it goes right back to what Mark said, and I agree to to, to, to in that kind of sense is that we all have to come together. This is a time where we're all going to have to be a part of this solution. It's not. I don't think the responsibility is um, uh, just private sector. I think public sector. Reform has to be there with regards to a new, a new, a new landscape. Um, private sector has to make has to make changes. Um, even within public, uh, the, the the public servants are going to have to have 
There are going to be new norms. I'm sure teachers are going to have to work longer hours because you have to have two shifts. There's going to be a lot of changes to take place, and I think um, we need to all really kind of come together and make this work. Otherwise, it, it can be the, the effects of the pandemic can be far worse if we don't all try to figure this out together. Um, it, it's true just outside of just the medical element of it and it's and the, and the, the havoc that it's uh, across the world it's this could be a lot worse if we own it could create serious risks in in, in, in in our society well I I look at the entire situation as one that we are on an aircraft flying and we're fixing the aircraft while flying let's hope we don't crash um, we are in a situation where we have to put aside our self We have, I've heard many people said before that we get leaders who we deserve. I don't know how you would put that in a box, but maybe we, maybe we have. We have to be in, in, we have to put ourselves in a situation where we have to look at the benefit of the people of this country and, and the growth of this country going forward. We have young people looking at our leaders and thinking, should I stay here or should I leave this ship? We already have too many brain drain. We already have too many students over the past five to 10 years who have left this country that had had some very good background, pathologists, master's in pathologists. We have people who have background in economics, in neuroscience, epidemiology. I mean, and these people were, they were told that they didn't have any positions, there were no jobs. How is that even possible? Now here we are in a crisis where we need those same people who are giving those same talents somewhere else in the world because we are narcissistic or we have leaders who are narcissistic. We have to stop fighting for the pettiness and we have to get on board because we all need each other. There is no politics in this. There is no skin color in this. There is no ethnic group in this. There is no socioeconomic status in this. We are all in this together. And if we don't stop the fighting and the back and forth about I'm making this money and you're not making that money and you're only doing this political wise, this whatever is happening economic wise, health wise, education wise, our country will disappear in the abyss. So I am saying that we need to have leaders and all those on board to ensure that all the people of Belize including below poverty line, average people, those who are comfortable. Let us all understand that we always say that Belize is blessed. Now let's give it back. Now let's give back to Belize since we're so blessed. And let's put aside the self esteem because all I'm hearing between PSU, and I'm glad Martin said is a that PSU actually stood up because the teachers always get the, I don't know if you can say it on TV, but the, the boo-boo end of the stick because we're always standing up. And I'm looking for money because increments don't mean anything to us. Because the more money you make, the more taxes you pay. So to hell with that, if I'm to say that. But the problem is, is that we've been fighting for a long time against corruption, against contractors, against they have they have um, posts in the public service um, ser um, service that they they just make up. It's not even on paper. It's just because you're my friend and I want to put you in a position. These are things that have been said over and over again. The PSU had had a cost saving measurement from six, seven years ago that nobody looked at, that nobody looked at because it's not in their benefit. We have to stop doing this. We have to call on a leader to help this country to go forward. Why are we still getting light from Mexico? Are we, what happened to solar energy? Aren't we a tropical country? Nobody's looking into that. We were part of CARICOM. We were supposed to suffice our needs and all the countries in CARICOM. Why did that go down the road? Now we are dependent. We're all dependable people. When we have so much land, we have so much that we can offer for our own people. Now this is the time. Now this is the time. Sometimes things happen for a good or bad reasons in our lives. Now this is the time for us to stop it, stop being petty, sit down around that table and say, listen, these are things we need to do to get back on track and to help all of these people and the country to grow. Because we're seeing what we have been doing in the past, it's not working. If we start doing that, 
then we're going to see some changes. But the Belizean people, just like following the rules of making COVID go away, we have to be able to be on board and not be selfless. And economic-wise, we'll get back. Health-wise, we'll get back. Education-wise, we'll get back. But we cannot do it if we're doing it in an isolated phenomenon. We have to work together. Thank you very much, Annie. Mark, I'll go to break, and then when we come back, I'll start off with you talking about the cost of COVID and uh, the economic burden. How do we talk about uh, equity in terms of sharing um, that burden, and how do we move forward? So we go to break. We'll be right back after these messages. In these challenging times, the one thing that is certain is that the Belize Bank Limited is here for you. There is nothing more important than your health and safety. And we continue to make every effort to make banking safer for you. Our staff is working around the clock to make sure you can do your banking conveniently 24-7 using our mobile banking app and online banking and keeping ATMs up and running. We value your relationship with us and are here to provide the support you need. First responders are also out there 24-7. Thank you, healthcare workers, security forces, firefighters, caregivers. You are all appreciated. Stay safe. We will get through this together. The Belize Bank, our country, your bank. At Dutch Lady, we give you delicious and nutritious milk. We make sure our milk is filled with essential nutrients, calcium, vitamins, and protein. Dutch Lady gives everyone in the family a strong start to the day. Keep your family healthy and happy. Dutch Lady, building strong families since 1871. Does the open road on a street cruiser sound like fun to you? What about riding through some dirt roads on a brand new leaf and trail bike? Perhaps zipping through the city is more your vibe. Whatever leaf and fits your lifestyle best, we've got it. Visit us or any of our distributors nationwide, or go online to see our wide range of leaf and motorcycles and parts. Leaf and bold, affordable, reliable. Welcome back to Uncovering COVID-19, a Channel 5 special. I'm your host, William Neal. And before we went to the break, we were talking about quite a bit of the economic issues related to COVID. And I know Mark had some comments before uh, we decided to go to break. I want to start there, but I also want to uh, pose a question. COVID has a serious cost across the economic base. How do we share that economic burden? Mark, that's my question for you after your comments. William, remember all the goods and services that we produce in this country, the government consumes about 30% or more in taxes. So right away, one third of our money almost goes to running government. So any serious conversation about sustainability has to start with one of your biggest Outputs, one of the biggest items that contribute to your cost of living in this country. Look, we're back to the cost savings report. I wanted to thank the teachers, of course, for always standing up for, for, for the measures that we need to have good governance and accountability in this country. They have been uh, this, big, this beacon, you know, calling for this constantly, but they can't do it alone. We all need to join in. William, one of the examples I wanted to highlight was, do you know that this cost savings report shows that government is paying water bill for addresses that it doesn't even have a presence, that government is paying electricity bill and water bill for places that it no longer rents? I mean, I could go on and on about the waste in government. And this has to fall directly at the lap of the public service people that are entrusted 
to run the money because they're not the government, they're not the ministers as individuals. They're responsible, but they're not the pay the bills. They're the public service people. So they have a big role to play in cost savings, right? If look, how do we how do we move out of this COVID situation and the reality that we're in today? We have to be sustainable. We have to be competitive and we have to be productive. We've been saying that over the weeks. And part of being sustainable means that you have to look seriously at cost savings and increasing your income in a way, not through increasing uh, in taxes, but increasing revenue to the country and having more throughput in the country, more activity in the country. That is the conversation that is lacking. What we hear the Prime Minister saying, and yes, I agree, we have to borrow to some extent, but we have to direct those borrowings to an area that contributes the most impact to the recovery of our economy. And I don't hear that conversation. As a matter of fact, when it talks to it, when you hear the talk about any kind of subsidy, regardless, we haven't even gotten to the stage of sector specific yet. The, 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 the answer is, look, we need money right now. We don't have no money for give. They couldn't even give the town councils duty-free or fuel for, for, for make the town councils try to continue their operations, cleaning the streets, whatever it is that they do. Imagine that. So this government is not talking about any kind of injection of stimulus that is going to cause, affect them, it looks like. They're not talking about any tax breaks. They're not talking about any reduction in taxes. Um, I don't hear that conversation. As a matter of fact, what I hear is the Prime Minister saying that the day of reckoning is coming. But I don't see the plans how we're going to deal with that day of reckoning. He says it's coming and somebody else will have to deal with it and it's going to be harsh. Why is it this important? Because the monies that we're borrowing now to continue to pay for an unproductive, and this is what the, this is what the, um, the cost savings report is saying, the productivity of labor is not commensurate with its cost. Talking about human resources management practices in the public service. So, you have to look at government first. They have to lead by example. When people point these things out to them, we're not trying to be divisive. We're not trying to be confrontational or political. We're just trying to look at this thing from a sustainable, economical, commonsensical point of view. You can't continue to spend more than you earn and, and, and balance all your budgets like you've been doing through borrowing, through unsustainable borrowing, because that is what, remember we used to talk about the fiscal space? No, we have no space to borrow or very little space to borrow. And that's why other countries are getting financial loans, getting, Costa Rica must get $500 million. Other countries will get, and we will be last in line because we have not managed properly. We have not followed some macroeconomic eh, 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 strategies, and we've we've been spending money like there's no tomorrow on projects and in areas that have not obviously benefited our people because our people have been um, getting poorer, our GDP has been falling. The report highlights these things. Our GDP has been falling consistently over the last five years. So while we have unprecedented borrowing and spending, we have unprecedented poverty. And the country, as a people, we're getting poor and we owe more. Now, why is that important? We spend, per person in this country, about $250 per month on running government. You know that? The, the people may think about that. Each one of us, every Belizean person, man, woman, child, the work, not the work, granny, baby, we're just man. Collectively, we spend $250 a month on government. So if you have a family of four, you, you give government $1,000 a month. That takes away from us. It takes away from the opportunities we have. It takes away from our competitiveness, and it takes away from the services that we should have from our government. And now we have this government, they fight over one seven percent oh, oh sorry, over one three to five percent reduction in, 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 in savings, right? Primarily based at a pay raise of all things. A pay raise. 
and 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 some and some and some uh, allowances. That that is the extent of your seriousness to this crisis we're in as a country. Please, make we get serious, man. And you can't continue kick the ball down the road. You can't continue to say make somebody else deal with it. As a responsible leader, you deal with it now. You should have dealt with it 10 years, 12 years ago when you came to power and said you were going to change the way you did things. That's why we voted you in. To do things differently. To bring about transparency. To bring about accountability. To turn our country around. And where are we today? We really have to ask ourselves, where are we today and why? Uh, now we're going to shift just a little bit and talk about the impact on the educational system. Obviously, uh, we see a situation where schools may not reopen for the remainder of this school year. And um, people are wondering if we'll see a return uh, come September. Annie, as a principal for a primary school, what are your thoughts? And um, especially in a, at a time when internet access is not readily available um, to everyone, um, moving forward, how do we help students to not fall behind? Well, they always say um, uh, whenever there are problems, that shows the weakest link um, in your um, in, for, for example, for us, education. We, we have now seen that there are so many weak links in the educational system in this country that we have to get on board now, more than ever. Um, it's costing a lot um, for us. It's not the academic wise, you know, we have over 6,000 teachers in this country who I am sure are capable of academically help to bring back these students the way that we want them to be. The problem where they want to deal with is the mental issues, especially with schools like mine. And I've talked about, I've talked to many principals too who are worried about <clears throat> the mental health of our students. This is a crisis most of them have, they have never, have never ever experienced before. And so mentally it's very hard on them, especially for our parents who are below that poverty line, who um, cannot find the food for them to eat. Many of the students go to school because we have a feeding program, and so they're healthy. Um, but they're not anymore because they're not they're not at school. So first of all, I'm thinking more of the mental part that our teachers will have to deal with when our kids go back. Fortunately for St. Martin, the poorest school, is that we have some very good um, counselors that have been there for a couple of years and um, who are associated with our school and help our children. So that will continue. But I worry about those who do not have that in place. What are they going to do for their children? That, that's the first thing. Second thing, yes, we want to bring them up to par. After we deal with their mental issues, we have to be able to understand that education is not within those four walls. Education is life. And we have to teach our children three things. One, numeracy, which has to do a lot with mathematical skills. Two, language arts, which has to do a lot with literacy, and three critical thinking skills. Over the past so many years, we have been indoctrinated into the educational system. Critical thinking skills are not being used. You're being told what to say, what to write, and you do it. Nobody asks questions, and that's one of our problems. We have to be able to sit our children down and say, listen, this is the crisis we're going through, and right now, science and social studies is not that important. But so what about you? What can you do if you are in a position to let them use their critical thinking skills? I'm telling you, if you put some children around a panel right now, they're going to solve our problems, you know. That's why I love being around children. Adults are hard to deal with. You ask a child right now, what are we, what are we to do? How are we going to go through this? They will give you some amazing answers. So we have to start using educational system as a way of getting through their critical thinking skills. So when we go back, whenever that is, I am very, I'm being very honest, I am not hopeful it's going to be September. Because if we start opening those borders and people start coming in, even tests that are positive or that are negative can be false. We are going to be seeing a lot of new norms. First of all, we have to be able to get our children ready. Our, our schools will have to have masks. We may have to wear gloves. 
we may have social distancing. Can you imagine telling my five-year-old they can't touch the other one? They can't go around the table with that other child? It's a whole new, it's a whole new system that we're gonna have to teach besides academics. Hence the reason I say their mental issue need to be a major focus besides getting them academically ready. And now that all of them, the must that the Ministry of Education say all of them need to go up, our teachers will now have to have intervention, not even teaching lessons, but we have to put interventions in place to help those to be on par with everyone else, along with the number of classes, number of children in a classroom. Some classrooms have 35, 40 children. What are we going to do with those classes? Do we have money to build buildings? We put so much investment in our prisons. How about putting some investment in building school buildings and helping out our schools? The next thing, internet. You're going to have to make sure that you're, you're in a new norm now. Books will have to be of, of, of the past. Most of our parents may not even have money to pay for any books or tuition. So we will have to find creative ways to make sure internet is available throughout the entire school. We have to go back to the days. Remember, history always repeats itself. We had slaves. Well, not me, but some people before me, like the Sabine, the Mark, the famous Mark. See, I knew it. They had slaves. Mr. Mark is a very intelligent man. Nothing is wrong with Mr. Mark with his slaves. We have to go back to the tablet, take away some of those books that we have are breaking our children's backs every day, and go back to tablets in the classroom, and go back to teaching and go forward in teaching technology, all technology. I mean, some of my parents have major problems because for their children to go to high school, they have to have email addresses. You know a lot of my parents don't even know what an email address is. So we have to re-educate even our parents to help them understand the type of technological world that we are in. So it's not only our children, it's not only our teachers, but also our parents and the community that we live in to assist these two school children in getting them back on track. Because we have to remember too, that back in those days, well in my days, we had Greek. I mean, I was a very spoiled child growing up. Didn't know what it is to do things for myself. But that gardening thing that they introduced many years ago, that was excellent. I know now, I could, I could know now to raise my own little pepper and papaya. I could never have known how to do that now in COVID 2019, 2020, if I didn't have that background. Do our kids have that now? Do they know anything about gardening? Yes, there's so many things mm -hmm. about gardening, but they know how to do it. They know exactly what to do. So it goes right back to our history. We have to go back to the historical part of our educational system. What was working back then? We even had teachers who weren't even trained, but they were the best teachers ever. So it's like we have to go back and then bring whatever was back there and mix it with the modern types of doing things to help our children get back in park. It can work, it's gonna be everybody on board, school, the community, Ministry of Education, parents, children, it can work. But as I always say, and I will continue to say, we have to do it together. Whether public school, private school, whatever school you go to, we have to do it together. And we have to equip our children. We can't say, oh, they can have access to internet, when they don't even know what, what, what that is in their homes. Many of our parents right now are fighting for survival. Right now we have what we call home-based learning. That's very good for those who have internet. But for the hundreds and hundreds of those children who do not have internet, what's gonna happen? Most of our parents are telling me, Miss, I, I love what you're doing with your teachers. They're WhatsApping us, they're sending us worksheets, they're visiting us, they're talking to us, they're video chatting with us. But we have survival that we need to think about. We have to feed our children. So with all due respect, we have to put the books aside. All those things we have to think about. So it, it's a whole new norm. It's a whole new way of living. And I am hoping that everybody understands that the benefit right now, the objective is that our children get the best possible education that they can. And I'm telling you, William, our children can rebound. We have resiliency with our children, but they need our support, they need our guidance, and they need our assistance, especially now more than ever. Thank you very much, Annie. And coming to you now, Dinesh, I know you've been on the front lines representing the Indian community and, uh, you know, the support in terms of care packages to quite a number of uh, people across the various constituencies in Belize City. 
Uh, one of the things uh, that I want to talk to you about and get you to chime in on is obviously COVID fatigue. Uh, the care packages that you're doing now, you know, you may not be able to, to sustain well um, into the future. But also um, your thoughts on how do you get people to remain engaged and not suffer burnout because the problems are are so um, overwhelming and um, seem unending. Um, yeah, that, that was actually that's something that we as the Indian community and, and several individuals have, have had this conversation even previously before COVID-19 is to understand that there are, um, there is, there are families that suffer in the city who, and this is only now sort of COVID-19 is now just now highlighted a lot of that, and in some cases brought people who were not in that situation into that into that um, into that realm of, of not being able to provide meals for their families because of unemployment. And and the other issue is that this we've now realized, and I think um, certain and there's there there's this informal economy that um, when they were applying for the unemployment element that weren't able to sort of classify as to where and those are the people who go out every day and basically you know make a buck that day and that's what they use to feed their families and that's now gone away and so that's something that has to be addressed that's not necessarily something um i mean I, that's a little bit of a tangent from what we were talking about but i think this and i've said this to, to a couple of people that i think this problem of of families not having enough to eat is going to be there even post um, what will then post COVID if there is such a thing or that norm. And so we are actually now looking at creating a program that's going to then be a permanent, and I hate to use the word permanent because then that would equate to it being a problem that will always be there. So ideally what we would like to do is to see how we can satisfy that um, that problem and, and kind of negate that, that, mitigate that issue of, people, of families not having enough to eat for long enough until it can go away. I mean, that's a little bit of an, I, I would be an idealist to think that that problem will, will ever go, go away. But um, call me if, uh, an optimist, but I think at some point we will be in a situation where that will go away. But I think um, as long as we can come up with something sustainable um, and, and the community is, has realized, I think people have, we've always been insular in some way. We've all, our community is always, um, families have always been feeding, whether it's the homeless or feeding, um, uh, helping other families and other institutions to feed um, families. We've always done it, but this is now what we're trying to do is concentrate, uh, have a more sort of cohesive effort to then cover a lot more people. Um, and I think that that part of you, the fatigue part um, that you mentioned, that. I don't think that will, will, will be ever to be the case because I think as long as you give from your heart, I don't think you'll ever have that problem where you think this is something that's gonna, I mean, as long as, I think as long as the community can give, we will give. And I've seen where we've had situations where people in the community, who, although their businesses have been, have been shut and they're basically making no revenue, have also con contributed to the cause. So I think, the, the desire and the heart is there, and so I think that's going to continue um, to, to take place. All right. Thank you very much, Dinesh. And with that, we're going to close this segment and take a break, and when we come back, we'll have our closing uh, block and also our parting shots. Don't go anywhere. Uncovering COVID-19, a Channel 5 special, concludes after these messages. Member owners are encouraged to save regularly, borrow wisely, and repay promptly. No use keeping the money in your pocket. Soon as you turn wrong, you know you ain't got it. So as money goes from hand to hand, give your cash to the umbrella man. I tell him you save, save, save the credit union way. Save, save, save it will make you rich someday. Stronger. Faster. 
comfortable, affordable, and powered by the trusted Cummings ISF 2.8 liter turbo diesel engine. We change the way the game is played. The new Photon Tunneling Truck and View CS2 Van. Available at Universal Hardware. Photon, the game changer is here. So nice, so nice. Caribbean price. Need you in my life. Caribbean price. So nice, so nice. 100% Belizean. 100% pure and natural. Yeah. For the young and the old, for the rich and the poor, we drinking Caribbean pride. Yeah. For the hot and the cold, so me want a little more, and me not tell no lie. So nice, so nice. Caribbean price. Need you in my life. Caribbean price. So nice, so nice. Well, alright. Tell them we drinking Caribbean pride. Orange juice, or get the grapefruit. Sweet Sweet and unsweet and you can choose Get the apple, the pineapple, the fruit punch Just pop the bottle, yeah Quality in every sip <sighs> Me tell you how me taste the pride in every drip, yeah Caribbean pride number one Tell, tell them we drinking Caribbean pride In these challenging times The one thing that is certain Is that the Belize Bank Limited is here for you There is nothing more important than your health and safety and we continue to make every effort to make banking safer for you. Our staff is working around the clock to make sure you can do your banking conveniently 24-7 using our mobile banking app and online banking and keeping ATMs up and running. We value your relationship with us and are here to provide the support you need. First responders are also out there 24-7. Thank you, healthcare workers, security forces, firefighters, caregivers. You are all appreciated. Stay safe. We will get through this together. The Belize Bank. Our country. Your bank. Welcome back to Uncovering COVID-19 at Channel 5 Special. I'm your host, William Neal. And uh, before we leave tonight, we'd like to check in on our viewers' feedback from last week. Umberto Juarez uh, wrote, Cater for the local population. Make affordable packages for the local tourist. It's not the solution but it can help to keep the tourism industry going as we wait for international tourists. Our borders are closed so people can be tourists in their own country. We have to help each other. Meanwhile, Andrea Liu wrote, can GOB revisit contracts for infrastructure projects such as roads and divert those monies to create short-term industries to create jobs immediately to close the unemployment gap, we need quick short-term recommendations to survive as a country for the next several months. Panel, any comments on those uh, comments from viewers? Well, I think, William, we saw that the, um, the president of the hotel association saying that um, they were encouraging their members to make packages that would be very affordable um, that might even include breakfast and, and you know that whole industry realizes that um, it needs to get going again and um, they have put in place new protocols they have put in place new 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 ways of dealing with the reality new sanitation measures um, etc so it's a good start um, as far as the, what was the second one? The second question was something about government doing yeah, something. Infrastructure projects. Oh yeah, the infrastructure projects. I think the Prime Minister has, has addressed that in his presentation, basically saying that contracts already signed would have to be honored, otherwise you, you run the risk of, um, of being sued, I guess, litigation, you know, you already have assigned contracts, the money has already been identified, the loans have already been uh, approved for those. So he gave the impression certainly that um, there was not flexibility in that, but for those contracts that had not been executed as yet, or for those phases of a certain contract that had not been um, 
executed uh, as yet, or, or work had not commenced, um, that, that those will not proceed. Um, and quite frankly, the other reason that the Prime Minister highlighted it was necessary for those contracts to continue was the foreign exchange laws that yeah. would come in um, as a result of that. So we're, 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 we're in a crisis, um, um, William, and um, it's complicated. But again, the fundamentals, uh, back to the question that your, your viewers um, um, watch, the fundamentals, I believe, is, is that we need to try and save. I think that's what the person is trying to say. Save where we can and redirect to those areas um, that Annie highlighted uh, that are critical. We have to have priority areas right now, I think, and the priority areas, of course, should be healthcare and security, you know, um, and things like that. Um, at some stage, William, I believe that we need to have a clear indication, uh, perhaps in the budget that the Prime Minister promised in a few months, so that people can know what are going to be the priority areas and where are the other areas that are not so high priority um, at this time. All right. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, let me now move to parting shots. Uh, Dinesh, let's start with you. Um, Thanks. What I wanted to say was um, expanding on, on, on the gentleman who said earlier about catering to, to locals and going back to what the, the local all the, the local ho um, the hotels are doing for, for, for local for local tourists. I think what this pandemic and this crisis is going to, to should you should do in a situation like this and most people if you're in a business, I think there's going to be you're going to have to pivot and adjust to what is considered the new norm. I think for some of the younger people out there, for some of the people who are a little bit bigger risk takers, I think there's gonna be opportunity um, for, for example, in, in e-commerce, um, I think as the centers now need to, I think, expand into situations where I think companies can become an enabling environment as far as being incubators for, for e-commerce, e e-platforms, um, and so we can then be able to harness the talent that we do have in this country, create an enabling environment for them to be able to then export that sort of talent, which doesn't necessarily require you to travel, per se, or to be able to then have... Now, yes, that might be something that might not be immediate, but I think it's something that if you see recently, you've seen a lot of uh, small um, startups uh, start this process of whether it's delivery services or e-commerce platforms and so the ability and the talent is there I think we now have a somewhat accelerated enabling environment and so it's important I think rather than say oh my god what am I going to do I think there's a lot of opportunity um, for for new businesses I think there's going to be you're going to have to adapt I mean I've seen it we, we um, I personally have, have been at the at the full spectrum of businesses um, that have been affected. Some in a good way, some in a bad way. I mean, we're in the in the grocery business, so as you know, when this first hit, that was basically everybody panicked. Um, there was a there was a huge um, run on on everything in uh, the stock up. Um, so we've managed to 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 do fairly well there. I think um, in in the in the, the real estate element of it we've not fared so well with most of our tenants being closed for during the lockdown and their businesses being affected both at that time and, and even now in the, in the current situation so I think um, I myself personally will have to look at, at, at different businesses as well um, things that I had looked at before and now maybe the environment's a little bit more conducive to that I think we're all gonna like like I said we're all in this together um, you know, it's, it's the old idiom, everything's, everybody's saying it, but it's true. And I think we all have, we all play a part in this. Um, and we have to understand that we, we as, a, as any business, you have to get up and kind of figure out how you're going to get through this process and look for those opportunities um, as best you can. I'm not saying that that might be the case for everybody, but I think that might be the case for most. And it's history, right? We've all gone through it. Uh, the economies have, have sprung from it. Um, and so I think we need to really look at this. And all I say is that please, please understand that outside of all of that, outside of the economic thing, it's we need to be very careful 
of what we do and and how it affects the, the our loved ones as well. So please kind of obey those rules. Well, not kind of, actually obey the rules, especially when it comes to crossing over that border. I've always had an issue about that whole trip to Chetamal in the first place, but that's a whole different new show. Um, <laughs> that, that, so that won't even... But, but now more than ever, it's now a point where it's a life or death situation. So I just ask, I really ask that people take that into consideration when, when I'm thinking about that. Thank you very much, Dinesh. Annie, your parting shot? Yes. Um, well, we, as I said before, the education system has been thrown a loop, uh, um, especially in Belize. Um, but it's also something that helps us to understand how we can go the way, how we can go forward. A couple of things we have to look at. Um, we have to look at tapping into new skills when we are in the educational system. Right now, we need more people in IT. Right now, we need more people to do, to do more in science. Right now, we need more people who would be researchers. And maybe we can have our own research centers to see how we can ourselves help to help with these diseases and viruses as they come along. We need to educate more people in that field. Also, we need to understand that we're now in a norm where face-to-face -face contact that we're used to, that's our type of way of living. We're used to going to the banks and to the utility departments and talk to people and see them face-to-face. Now we have to realize that we have to have trained online <clears throat> because everything will have to do online. So like what um, the mission said, it said that it has to do a lot with now the new norm is online training, e-commerce, e-business, e-platforms. So our educational system will have to train now our children, which I don't think it will be hard because five, I have seen five-year-olds put together a computer with me in awe. I don't think it's difficult. We, they just need to be guided because now we understand the new norm is that there are no more um, the books. We have to go into training children into knowing how to get online, how to be online, how to be very savvy when it comes to the internet and for us to use the educational system for us to get there. Also, policies will need to now be amended or put in place for the educational system to go the new norm because we will have to change our policies. Every school will have to change their policy to, <clears throat> to adapt to what they um, or what their children will be able to get used to. Um, and then also, like what was said before, I think, we, the Ministry of Education may have to think about um, how we're going to get teachers to teach lots of our children who are in the classroom by having shift systems. Um, but again, everybody has to be on board the Ministry of Education, can't just come from a group of people. All of us need to sit down and say, this is the new norm, and this is what we have to do for the benefit of our children. <clears throat> I want to end off by um, saying quotes for our teachers, especially on Teachers Day today. Um, I want to let them know that our system has now changed. We have to get a new norm. We're living a new life. Um, we are going to have to teach our children the new way of living. And we have to have fun doing it, even though we might be overwhelmed. We have to be able to be quick to let our children know, yes, this is a challenge. All part of us, it's all part of our growth. It's all part of your educational background, but we're going to do this together. And I want to let each of them know that not every teacher can be called to this great profession, but those who are, the title is reserved for the great ones like you. I want you to understand that, to continue doing the job that you're doing, doing with passion, do it with love, and I'm telling you, you're going to see a change in the educational system. All right. Thank you very much, Annie. And uh, Mark, your parting shots? Yes. I would l really like to encourage all the unions and the public service union especially to get back to the table and present the nation with a truly realistic, concrete, eh, 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 doable, you know, cost savings strategy. Uh, and I would encourage the government to seriously reconsider its position and to reconsider coming back to us with a strategy that will be meaningful and will have a meaningful impact on our macroeconomic situation and the realities that we're in today. Um, every penny that we are wasting, we need right now to help more people. Remember, we had 80,000 people apply. The program had to be stopped. Um, Mr. Joni was saying um, a while ago that 
you know, um, many people will still be faced with the reality of not having meals. Many children still in the country need, need to be fed. We will have a lot of needs. So we don't have room to waste in our country today. We have to be very efficient. We have to be very productive. I, I, I said I was going to remind people every week at the end of this show to, to, to challenge themselves to be productive in the, in, in the next week. What are you going to do? What are you going to learn? Uh, uh, but keep busy, especially the kids um, that are out of school right now. Learn something new. Pra practice planting. Practice creating things. Um, and that is important because our country needs to perhaps change the way it produces goods and services and we need to we need to find some meaningful way to remain engaged in the economic mainstream and contribute to our country's gross domestic product. Um, we need for the government to, we're in, we're in May, it's May dear now, okay? We need to have had plans in place on how we're going to address certain things, at least broad guidelines to give certainty, not only to our people, but to the business community, to see what direction our policy makers are going to be taking us. In the absence of that, in the absence of some policy stimulus, at least, if you can't give economic stimulus, you won't see people taking uh, uh, extraordinary risks. And what we need to do at the end of the day, is to find ways to bring back those people into our economy. Yes, we know tourism is going to hopefully play a role in that in the future, but that is still for the most part uncertain, and we need to focus on the strengths and the resources that we have today, and how do we strengthen them even more and grow them so we could bring back that 130,000 plus people that we have that are dependent right now on government that we bring them back into the mainstream economy. The conversations need to be broadened. Everybody should be invited around the table and we need to almost again be sector specific. I'm glad that the government worked with the um, and listened to the, to the tourism sector at least to get the local tourism back going but we, they need to have that conversation with other sectors of the economy and they need to have that conversation last month, not today, not next week, but months ago we should have had those conversations. Again, I end by saying, where are the plans? The plans that I've heard this week, they not lend to any good feeling for me because we have heard that the day of reckoning is coming and that it's not going to be nice. And I say, if you have an issue, you deal with it now. You know, kick the can down the road. Thanks, William. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, COVID kindness for tonight. Congratulations to CDF Belize, The Word at Work, and Sunny City Supermarket for coordinating delivery of food packages to 58 families in Armenia, Cotton Tree, and Maya Mopan, who have not received other food assistance and who were in need. Thank you for answering the needs of those families. I want to close tonight by thanking our panel for joining me tonight and uh, pretty much uh, talk about the common thread for me in all the comments uh, is what is the new normal and what does that mean. Success was often equated with thinking outside the box, but it seems like we're all living outside the box now. So success in the new normal may actually require that we destroy the proverbial boxes and help each other live outside our individual bubbles. Thank you for joining us. I am William Neal reminding you to wear your mask, stay safe, and practice uh, and maintain safe social distancing. Until next week, take care. Covering COVID-19 pandemic, a Channel 5 special was brought to you by the Belize Bank Limited, Santiago Castillo Limited, Universal Hardware, Holy Redeemer Credit Union, and Citrus Products of Belize Limited.